I'm Larry Walther. This is PrinciplesofAccounting.com, Chapter 7. In this module, we will look at alternative approaches to applying the allowance method for accounting for uncollectible accounts. In the previous video, in the previous module, uh, we compared and contrasted the direct write-off method and allowance methods without really looking at the mechanics of allowance methods. It was pointed out that the allowance methods are required under generally accepted accounting principles because of their better matching, their better conceptual underpinnings. So now it's time to look closer at these allowance methods. The allowance is an estimate of uncollectibles. And the allowance is necessary because if management knew which accounts were likely to prove uncollectible from the outset, sales to those customers would have likely been avoided to, be, to begin with. So we provide an overall or aggregate estimate against our entire outstanding receivables to determine the portion we think are uncollectible. This might be done as a percentage of total receivables, such as 6% of all outstanding receivables. These percentages would, would not be the same for all companies. They would ba be, be based on the historical experience of the company, their best judgment, their best estimate about what rates are appropriate. We might also look at the accounts receivable and do an aging where we stratify the accounts receivable by how long they've been outstanding and we apply different percentages to each strata to determine the appropriate balance for the allowance account. So let's look closer at these balance sheet approaches. Here is an aging that we've done in a spreadsheet. We have a total accounts receivable of $425,000. $250,000 of that is current. $100,000 is 31 to 60 days old and so forth. And we know for this company from past experience that 1% of our current receivables proved to be uncollectible. The other 99% we anticipate collecting, 5% for the next strata and so forth. And simply multiplying the percentages times the balances in each strata gives us an estimate of the amount of uncollectibility attributable to each strata, which we total up and find that we expect $25,500 to be the estimate of the amount uncollectible out of our total $425,000. Now both of these approaches I've just described, whether it's a percentage of the outstanding, the total outstanding accounts receivable on the balance sheet, or via an aging, both of these approaches are termed balance sheet approaches. We've looked at the outstanding accounts receivable on the balance sheet and done some analysis to determine what portion we think will not prove to be collected. We're looking at the balance sheet and deriving an estimate of the uncollectible. Okay? So, in our fact situation, we had a $25,500 VRR aging. We had a $25,500 amount we expected to not be collected. I'm assuming we already had a $10,000 balance in the allowance prior to that aging. That suggests that we need an additional $15,500 in our allowance account. Here's the credit to the allowance for uncollectibles. That amount increases the allowance account from $10,000 to $25,500. That is the contra account that appears on the balance sheet, the subtract from outstanding accounts receivable. If you're not sure how that appears, the previous video ended with a screenshot of how that balance sheet would appear, the receivables less the allowance for uncollectibles. The offsetting debit here is a debit to expense. That's the expense that's recorded in this particular time period. Let's give this just a few more thoughts. The amount of the entry was based upon the needed change in the account. It was the $25,500 with the balance sheet approach was the desired target or desired amount in the account. It was not the amount to expense. We expensed the amount to bring it up to the balance sheet target. The debit is to an expense account and reflects the added cost for that particular period of time. I know from experience that students sometimes find this problematic. So let's look. Here's our aging. It shows the $25,500 desired balance. Notice how that corresponds. I had a 10,000 existing balance in my allowance account. I need 25,500. I'm adding 15,500. We write off a specific account. We'll debit the allowance account and credit accounts receivable. What effect does that have on income? The answer is none. Neither of those are income statement accounts. This is a contra account to accounts receivable, a balance sheet amount, and the accounts receivable, of course, is a balance sheet account. They actually offset one another. This entry has no effect on income. Remember, the expense was recorded when we set up the allowance. Consider the balance sheet before the write-off. We had a net realizable value of $109,000 for the receivables, that is, accounts receivable of $120,000 less an allowance of $11,000. If we look over here at after the write-off, in the middle I'm deducting $5,000 for the write-off 
from both the account receivable and the allowance account. After the write-off, we still have $109,000 in accounts receivable net. It's 115,000 gross accounts receivable, but now the allowance account is only 6,000. So it really has no effect on our net values on the balance sheet either. So the write-off, it's not a non-event in the, in the true sense of the word, but it's a non-event from an accounting context because the effect of the bad debt was captured back when the allowance account was established concurrent with the sale recording. When we collect an account that has been previously written off, we might write someone off and then later, unexpectedly, we collect the amount. Uh, the custom is to reverse the entry that was recorded when the receivable was written off, so we would debit accounts receivable and credit the allowance account. That puts the receivable back on the books, it reestablishes the allowance account, and then we record the collection of the receivable, debit cash, and credit accounts receivable. Now some students will go, well yes, but you, you put an allowance on the books now for an amount that's not collected. Well that's true, but that goes into the aggregate pool of the allowance. And remember at each financial statement date we should logically review the total balance of the allowance to determine whether our estimates are on target or off target and potentially make adjustments to get back on track with what we expect our full allowance to eventually prove to be.